just want to prep our audience for this. If you've never heard Chris talk, he is a, he is a very engaging speaker. You may want to grab a notepad and a pen because you're about to learn an awful lot. And I can't wait till we get to the Q&A. So I want you to go to crusade.chat and load up some great questions for Chris Ferrara. And uh, we'll get to that part after the presentation. Chris, Michael and I are just going to throw it to you and I'll welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Chris Ferrara. Okay, I have to cover the entire uh, roadmap of this in 18 minutes, apparently. That's what I'm hearing. And do you hear me? Yes, sir, mm -hmm. we sure do. Okay, so the topic is, what does our Lord's social kingship mean in practice? And, and you're right, this is not a lofty ideal, especially on the level of the moral law. Not only is it achievable, it has to be achieved if our civilization is going to survive. Right now, we're in the middle of a kind of viral epidemic, worse than any particular coronavirus. It's the virus of apostasy, a civilizational apostasy that has been 500 years in the making. And patient zero of that apostasy would have to be Martin Luther, almost exactly 500 years ago, when he destroyed the unity of Christendom. And this was followed by a philosophical revolution in the 16th and 17th centuries, in which philosophy was uh, separated from theology. And that philosophical revolution was followed in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries by the age of democratic revolution, producing what we have today, the modern state system with its separation of church and state and its relentlessly declining public and private morality, for which the only remedy, the only vaccine, if you will, for this virus is the social kingship of Christ. So what does it mean in practice? We begin with the question that our Lord asked Peter, and you'll see that in the first slide. But whom do you say that I am? And Peter's answer, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So all of this flows from the answer to that question. If Christ is who he says he is, many things follow for the individual, for society, for civilization at large. Now, our Lord said some things that are cited against this idea of the social kingship of Christ. In the next slide, you'll see the first thing that he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from hence. And he said something else in his confrontation with the Pharisees, as we see. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. But what the people who cite these passages from Scripture never mention is that Caesar too must render unto God what is God, what is God's. And that is the essence of the social kingship. What did our Lord say in the prayer that he taught us? You'll see in the next slide. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Moving forward, we see that this means in practice that the heavenly kingdom of God must be reflected in the earthly kingdoms of the world. Caesar too must render unto God what is God's. The nation must do so, not just the individual. And that is why our Lord said, as we see on the same slide, going therefore teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you all things whatsoever I have commanded you not only the individual but nations now our Lord was speaking not of the modern nation state when he uttered these words these words of divine revelation he was speaking of every race of men on the face of the earth which later became organized into the modern state system into a collective that is nonetheless in each country bound to recognize the authority of Christ the King. So, moving forward in the presentation, we get to the next slide. Christ is a king in the sense of a ruler, a ruler whose word and whose command must be obeyed. We read in the book of Revelation, and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he may strike the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. How 
sad it is that we have forgotten the wrath of God. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords, which means quite simply that Christ is the king who rules over the kings of the earth, who rules over the presidents of the earth, who rules over all civic authorities on the face of the earth. That is what the social kingship of Christ means. It means much more than that individual believers can, if they choose to do so, follow the gospel. Moving ahead, we see in the seminal encyclical on this by Pius XI, Quas Primus, issued in 1925, between the two world wars, by the way, it would be a grave error, he says, on the other hand, to say that Christ has no authority whatever in civil affairs, since by virtue of the absolute empire over all creatures, committed to him by the Father, all things are in his power. Thus, the empire of our Redeemer embraces all men. All men, regardless of their religion or lack of religion, regardless of their political system, regardless of the size of the collective represented by the modern state system. Communist China is governed by Christ the King. The United States is governed by Christ the King. Brooklyn is governed by Christ the King. The local YMCA is governed by Christ the King. All collectives and all individuals are governed by his authority because, as he told Peter, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity. And in his divinity, obviously, he rules over the entire earth. Now, what did Leo say about this? We see in the next uh, uh, slide. The consequences of this are that the empire of Christ includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons, but all. Not only those who have been uh, led astray by Arab or have been cut off from her by schism, but also all those who are outside the Christian faith so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. Pope Leo the Thirteenth, Adam Sacrum, 1899. Moving ahead to the next slide. So this means a social kingship of Christ, a kingship over the social order, not just the individual. Christ is the king of societies, not just individuals in society. And even the document of the Second Vatican Council on Religious Liberty recognizes the duty of men and societies toward the one true church and the one true religion. And it's absurd to deny this. One cannot logically argue that the individual is subject to the authority of Christ. The individual must follow his gospel. But by some strange process, that duty of adherence to the law of the gospel and to the teaching of the church breaks down at the level of the collective. That very idea, of course, is the reason society is falling to pieces. Because Pope Leo said that the relation between the church and the state is akin to that between the body and the soul. And if you cut the connection between a body and its soul, you end up with a dead body, a dead body politic. The body politic in which babies can be slaughtered in the womb by the millions, even at the very moment they're being born. And that's what we see today we see a social corpse because of the severance of the connection between Christ the King, whose authority is mediated to society through the church and civil society. In fact, one commentator has said that the whole project of modernity, the age of democratic revolution, overthrowing the altar of the, th the order, order of altar and throne, that whole project is motivated by one thing and one thing only, as he says the emancipation of the body politic from the influence of the Catholic Church. And that's why we're in this situation. Our state, the states of the Western world, the states throughout the world, have no connection to Christ because they have no connection to the Church any longer at the social level. The Church has been privatized in this country in particular. It's reduced to a social gathering. And now the bishops themselves in the face of this virus have shut even that down. We can't go to Mass but we can get our dogs groomed and buy marijuana at a marijuana dispensary. That shows the radical severance of social action, social policy, laws and institutions from the authority of Christ in favor of merely human institutions and human traditions. So, moving ahead. This means in practice, the social kingship of Christ, 
that the state must conform its laws and institutions to the law of the gospel. Again, Caesar too must render unto God what is God's. And here I would note parenthetically that there was a movement of evangelical Protestants in this country in the mid 1860s, during and after the Civil War, which warned this country at huge conventions at which many spoke, including a retired Supreme Court justice, that unless the Constitution of the United States were amended in its preamble to recognize the social kingship of Christ, that his revealed will is the law of the land, this country would descend into moral chaos and American politics would become, as one of the speakers put it, a godless, Christless blank. And that all of the laws and institutions in this country would descend to the level of what they called, not me, not even any traditional Catholic, but what these Protestants called in the 1860s a godless constitution. If the constitution had recognized the social kingship of Christ in its preamble, Roe versus Wade would not have been possible. That's just one example of what happens when you sever the collective, when you sever political society from the law of the gospel. Moving ahead, the first practical consequence of the social kingship of Christ, as I've just indicated, is the union of church and state. Not in the sense that the church dictates public policy. There wouldn't be a Vatican sanitation department in every country, for example. But it means that, as I said earlier, the church is the conscience of the state. So the separation of church and state is not a thing to be desired. It's a deadly error. And Pope St. Pius X said exactly that when the French enacted the infamous law of separation, finally separating church from state in France in 1905. And here is what he said, that the state must be separated from the church is a thesis absolutely false, a most pernicious error, because it's based on the principle that the state must not recognize any religious cult. And it is guilty, he says, of a great injustice to God. For the creator of man is also the founder of human societies and preserves their existence as he preserves our own. We owe him, therefore, said this great pope, a saint, not only a private cult, but a public and social worship to honor him. And besides, he said, this thesis negates the supernatural order because it limits the action of the state, and this is John Locke's false teaching, to the pursuit of public prosperity during this life only, which is but the proximate object of political societies. And it doesn't occupy itself, said Pius X, in any way with the ultimate object of political society in an alliance with the church, which is man's eternal happiness after this short life shall have run its course, end quote. Our whole society is thrown into a state of panic right now over the remote possibility that someone might die from a virus. But no one cares at the level of public policy about the ultimate goal of our existence, eternal beatitude. We are witnessing a mass hysteria based on loss of the eternal perspective, the loss of all hope of life eternal. And that's one of the consequences of failing to recognize that the church is the conscience of the state. That's the theological significance of the social kingship of Christ. What is the moral significance? Moving ahead, we see it. There is no divorce under the social kingship of Christ. There is no civil marriage. There is no legalized abortion. There is no sale or distribution of contraception. There is no legalization of sodomy. And there is no pornography. Moving ahead. There is, and this is the big one that I would discuss here in terms of modern errors, no freedom of speech in the modern sense. And here's how Pope Leo XIII describes the consequences of this error. Men, he says, have the right and freely and prudently to propagate throughout the state whatever is true and honorable because we're all entitled to the truth. But he goes on to say that lying opinions, than which no mental plague is greater, and vices which corrupt the heart and moral life, should be diligently repressed by public authority, lest they insidiously work the ruin of the state. Moving ahead. What are the consequences of rejecting 
this linkage between the church and state, accepting the modern notion of liberty, with all of its errors, absolute freedom of conscience, separation of church and state, freedom to profess any and all errors in the public square. The consequences are the end of civilization, nothing less than that. Benedict XV said this in Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum in 1914, during the First World War, for ever since the precepts and practices of Christian wisdom cease to be observed in the ruling of states, it followed that as they contained the peace and stability of institutions, the very foundations of states necessarily began to be shaken. I repeat, the foundations of the state began to be shaken when the state at the level of the collective ceased to recognize the precepts and practices of Christian wisdom. Such, he went on to say, moreover, has been the change in the ideas and the morals of men, these modern errors I've been talking about, that unless God comes soon to our help, the end of civilization would seem to be at hand, end quote. And God did come to our help. We know about the message of Fatima in 1917, in which Our Lady said, the First World War would end, but if men did not change their ways, a worse war would come. Russia would spread its errors throughout the world, including the legalization of abortion and divorce. And in, in the end result would be that various nations would be annihilated, which we have yet to see, but perhaps we're getting intimations of that now. Now, let's go to the final part of this brief discussion. We're told this is pie in the sky. America is not Catholic. How can America be Catholic? Well, my, my answer is, why not? There's one simple answer, contraception. If you are watching this video and you are a Catholic, or even if you're a Protestant and you think you're a godly follower of Jesus Christ, and you are using contraception, you are individually in part to blame for the current state of affairs in political society, which is disastrous, as we know. Why is that? Well, if you don't practice contraception, then you're obviously following the law of the gospel because that is a signature of someone who is a Christian. He brings souls into the world, as many as God will give him as gifts. He has a large family. The couples who bring these children into the world will tend to be serious Christians who trust in divine providence and believe that there's something more than this worldly life. They live for the next life. They want to fill up the number of the elect and they bring souls into the world. The practice of contraception in and of itself is a sign of the total collapse of the moral order. So, is this pie in the sky? Think about it. If every Catholic had declined to practice contraception over the past 50 years, there might be two to three times the number of Catholics in the electorate today. We comprise about 25%. Most of them are not observant. But if they were observant and they had not practiced contraception, we might be 60% of the electorate today. Do you think we would have the state of moral collapse that we now witness in America? Obviously not. Don't complain about the outcome of democracy if you have failed to give birth to Christian soldiers. So the first step in recovering Catholic social order is throw away the contraceptive devices. Otherwise, don't complain about politics. Which brings me to the conclusion. The final consequence of what is happening because of the rejection of the social kingship of Christ the King. Pius XII, Evangelii Preconis, 1951. After the Second World War, so you can't say this was apocalyptic talk motivated by our world war. That was over. We were in the optimistic post-war period. And here is what he said. Venerable brethren, you are well aware that almost the whole human race is today allowing itself to be driven into two opposing camps. For Christ, or against Christ. The human race is involved today in a supreme crisis, which will issue in its salvation by Christ or in its dire destruction, end quote. Those are the stakes involved in the social kingship of Christ. And it begins with something as simple as basic morality. That's all we have to do really as the first practical step to restoring the social kingship, even in this country. Simply practice basic morality. Bring souls into this world for the greater glory of God and for their eternal beatitude, which is our goal, as the church taught again and again. And because this understanding of social order has been lost, that is why we're facing the situation now 
in, wh in which an entire nation is thrown into hysteria over the prospect of possibly dying from a virus in one's old age, principally, when everyone has to die, as President Bolsonaro of Brazil said. And that's my presentation. Well, Chris, thank you very much. Great presentation. That was awesome. So we're going to get to Q&A, but before we do, we got to listen in. Do you have any questions or uh, maybe a, a, a point to make about Chris's presentation? Well, I think that his, his point about bringing our society back to morality as a practical step towards restoring the social kingship of Christ is well made. Um, I, I was wondering if maybe you could... You could uh, develop that thought just a little bit more for me, um, because a lot of times people say that, well, you know, morality is based on individual ideas or morality is based on what society thinks. So how do we develop a, a more moral society? I mean, obviously, individually as Catholics, as long as we adhere to Catholic teaching, that's, that's where we need to begin. But for those who are not Catholic, how do we convince them that there is a moral way of living that is better for society and better for them individually as it leads to the path of restoring the kingship of Christ? Well, the way to do that is not to say God has issued his law, God is the cop, the supernal cop in the sky with a nightstick who's going to beat you over the right. head. <laughs> no, morality exists for our good. God commands what is good because it is good. He's not the positivist God whose will is law just because he says so. That's the God of uh, the philosophers of the 18th century, right? The, the God who was a nominalist. No, God commands what is good because it is good. So for example, taking the teaching on contraception, if you avoid contraception and you bring souls into the world, that is the way to happiness. People don't understand this. When I was practicing law privately, people would come in with terrible financial problems. They would be looking to go bankrupt. And I would ask them how many children they had. One, maybe, maybe two. And I would say, well, that's the problem. If you want to get out of your financial situation, have a bunch of children and the blessings will come. They looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> I know. because they don't understand it. But this is what, what we have to teach people, that the moral order is imposed upon all of creation, upon all of humanity by God for the happiness and flourishing of the human person. And when people try to avoid what God commands and throw down the yoke that is easy and the burden that, that is light, they lay low packs onto themselves. They end up miserable. They end up divorced. They end up with no children because they delay trying to have children. Then it's too late. And then they use immoral methods to try to conceive children. And I guess, the, again, the political consequence of this is we don't have any Christian voters. We don't have enough of them. Right. We're constantly worried about whether we have 50% plus one to tip some election or other in our favor precariously. And then we breathe a sigh of relief. We should be 60% of the population at least at this point. And if we, if we believed only in the moral teachings of the church, even if you had some questions about some doctrine, but you understood basic morality, as many evangelicals do. There are evangelicals that have 10, 11 children. If we understood that much, the landscape politically and socioeconomically in this country would be so much different. Yes, even economically. Businesses would flourish like you wouldn't believe. Now, Chris, I want to follow up on that. It's something you and I have talked about many, many times. By the way, welcome back. If you're, if you're just joining us, I'm Mike Church. He's Michael Hitchborn. We have Christopher Ferrara on uh, the Crusade Live Cam here with us. Uh, something that you and I have talked about many times and you bring up in several of your books, including the book that we're going to give away today, Liberty of the God That Failed. Talk about for a minute, and, uh, um, and I didn't hear it in the talk, talk. Maybe I just wasn't listening close enough. But you and I have talked about this, and you kind of uh, helped me to learn this, that error has no rights. Yep. And that error well, in know, the public yeah. square has no rights, right? It, there is no right to propagate what is wrong. It's a nonsensical proposition. Let me give you a concrete example in, in terms of the social kingship of Christ. We're told that now there's a right to propagate error in the matter of religion. You have the right to go around and say Christ is a fraud. Christ was just a magician at best. His teachings are false. You should reject his teachings. In fact, you should reject the existence of God. Now, what are the consequences of, of, that, of that kind of thinking if it is allowed to be propagated? Well, people lose the faith. They come under the influence of this kind of thinking. They lose the faith. Morality collapses, and the nation descends into what we see now, moral chaos. Now, the absurdity of the modern notion of liberty is this. 
I cannot propagate error about commercial transactions. Suppose I were to say, buy my vitamin supplement, and it's worthless. And I know that it's worthless. And people spend maybe $10 for a bottle of my supplement. Not only would I get sued, I could probably be criminally prosecuted in certain jurisdictions because people had to part with $10 based on fraudulent advertising. But we're told that if people part with their immortal souls, well, that's just a constitutional right. That's the absurdity of it. The concept of suppressing error has never been lost. What has been lost is the proper object of that suppression, not hate speech, so-called hate speech, but speech that leads people astray, that leads them to their eternal doom. I don't understand how believers who profess the Catholic faith can fail to see what Leo said, that if you don't repress lying opinions, especially those in the matter of religion, then you will insidiously work the ruin of the state in the name of freedom. And that's not freedom. That's slavery. Do you think this is freedom right now? No. Where no. 50 million, 50 million children can be aborted, or 35 million children can be aborted every year? Are we free when a marriage can be dissolved by a civil court because one partner or the other decides he or she is tired of the relationship and they take away your children and your property, even though you have a sacramental marriage? And if you try to undo that, you're arrested for contempt of court? Right. Is that freedom? No. We don't have religious freedom in this country any longer. Not really. We have the freedom to believe certain things, but even that is now being threatened. We're being told we can't go to Mass. Governors are telling us, church is not allowed. Church is not allowed. You can't go to Mass. It's not an you essential service. To, yeah, Michael, you, you have a question. Pet store. You can go to the pet store. You can go to the <laughs> marijuana dispensary. You know, uh, actually, what you're talking about with um, <clears throat> with liberty as the god that failed, I, I think that it actually leads very well into this. Uh, our first question from uh, Alfred. Um, Alfred asks, how do we talk about the social reign of Christ the King in a Masonic country? And, it, you know, you think about... Outlaw, outlaw masonry. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Well, <laughs> What's one way? Well, let's just call masonry what it is, a non-essential service. A non-essential service, free masonry. Right, right, right. Chris, how would you respond to that question? Well, that's, that's the practical problem, and I, I gave you the answer to that. Yeah. You wouldn't have to talk to a Masonic nation about the evils of Freemasonry and try to talk people out of it if there were more people who don't subscribe to those errors and the way to get more people who don't subscribe to those errors is to get catholics for one group in society to simply follow the moral teaching of the church it's because of contraception that we don't have an electorate 60 percent catholic right the catholic moment passed so chris chris can i follow up on that with you uh, quickly here sure. on the on the 60 percent um President Trump was elected with 53% of the Catholic vote. You you were on my radio show on the Crusade Channel at crusadechannel.com, shameless plug. Mm -hmm. The day after the election, you said America had been pulled back from the precipice. Right. Uh, and no president can be elected if he doesn't win the Catholic vote. Under exactly. the social kingship of Christ, don't our priests, bishops and then priests, have a moral responsibility to tell us that as parishioners, as laity? Oh, yeah. yeah Romano Amario, toward the end of his masterwork, Iota Unum, says that civilization remains capable of metanoia, which is a turning away from sin and a, and a mass conversion. Uh, if the offer is made to it, it can't initiate the offer, but it's capable still of accepting it if it's proposed by the church, obviously. So if bishops united with the clergy to bring about a moral revolution in this country, you could remake the face of this land in six months to a year, but they're not doing it. Instead, they're shutting down the churches out of fear of a coronavirus. It's preposterous, never in the history of the church. In 2000 years has Easter been canceled, not even during the bubonic plague. It is incredible. In the 1500s. Uh, it, it, Easter canceled. Right. Uh, uh, um, following up now, let's move on. We have a great question from viewer Todd. Todd asked, would you please ask Mr. Ferrara, speaking uh, to having children, what resources are there on reaching the unbeliever using just the natural law? In other words, how do we bridge that gap with people without uh, falling to utilitarianism? Mm. And I think this is a great question, uh, Michael, and I, I think Chris will agree. 
because you can make natural law arguments for almost every part sure. of the social kingship of Christ. And the reason that we don't think of this is because we don't think natural, supernatural, that the supernatural governs the natural. Chris, how would you ask uh, answer Todd's question? Well, maybe in a way he doesn't expect. I think we're beyond natural law arguments. People don't get yeah. the natural law. They laugh at you if you say there's a natural law. What are you talking about? Right. There's no natural law. The way you reach people on this is to talk about human flourishing and happiness. You say to them, have children. You will experience the joy of having children. Don't worry about how many children you have. The blessings will come. People still respond to the idea that God will give them blessings. Of course, everybody wants blessings from God. Nobody believes in a God who condemns anyone, but they all want his blessings. Politicians routinely ask God to bless America. So I would say to people, think outside the box in which you've been confined by public opinion by the past 50 years of, of, the, of the pandemic, as it were, of contraception, and think about how happy you would be if you had more than one child. So Many women wish they did have more children. Right. So in other words, kind of take the uh, heresy that is Americanism and make right. it unheretical. <laughs> say, here, say, say to people, here's a thought that might not have occurred to you. A large family is the way to happiness. Well, there's even a TV show. I don't forget the name of the show where they have 12 kids. You know that show, right? Well, there was so eight is enough. Yeah. About this family with 16 children. And people eat it up. They love to watch it. Oh, yeah. He's thinking of the uh, the Duggars. The Duggars. Oh, yeah, but there the was two, there, there's yeah. two great movies, though. Um, uh, 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 Cheaper, Cheaper by, by the, the Dozen. Cheaper by the Dozen. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid, I can't remember who it was, are very happy in their... No, it's uh, um, uh, Steve Martin. It's Steve Martin. So you're thinking of the remake, though. The, the original. Right, the remake. The yeah. original had Fred McMurray. Okay. Final yeah. question here, because we got to wrap up here from Bradley. Chris, sure. with virtually every social entity in the realm of public life blocking, castigating, ridiculing, and condemning Christianity, what are actions that we can take that help make Christ's social reign more mainstream and accepted? Or is it even possible in today's world dominated by Mammon and Moloch? What say ye? Well, we, ha we have to make the effort to present the social kingship of Christ, as I've suggested throughout here today. Mm -hmm. as a recipe for human happiness and flourishing. People don't respond to legalistic arguments anymore. God has given us his law. We must obey his law. He is a king who rules with an iron hand. There will be eternal consequences. There is a hell. But when people aren't receptive to that message any longer, you have to open the door to this discussion with references to things that they can relate to, such as how to be happy, how to flourish, how to get God's blessing. The Protestants have a distorted version of this, the prosperity gospel. Mm. But we should have a Catholic version of the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is have families that are large. Don't worry about wh what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, as our Lord said. Trust in God's providence. That's one approach. But the other approach is, is simply this. In the end, it's a matter of divine grace. We're not Pelagians. We can't. Uh, the, the faith is not a self-improvement movement. <laughs> you can't use life coaches. The Bible is not a self help book. The Bible is not a self help book. Uh, on that, no. we're going to go to <laughs> we're going to go to our giveaway. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris has, has donated as we have been talking about all day, which uh, which is why you use the uh, the links in your Crusade Live emails to forward uh, that to friends and family throughout the day, even today, mm -hmm. to to keep people tuning in and to keep more and new people tuning in. And it goes to your credit. Here's how we pay you back. We give you a great prize from one of our speakers who are all have an, apost uh, an apostolate of one form or another. In Chris's instance, his apostolate is being an author. So Chris has given us a brand new hardcover copy of his best-selling expose on classical liberalism, Liberty, the God that Failed. I love, love, love this book. Policing the Sacred and Constructing the Myths of the Secular State from Locke to Obama. This is a book that is universally regarded as a seminal work in the in the modern Christ the King movement. And as has become custom, we are now going to proceed to our winner and our fake drum roll. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Evan in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Congratulations, Evan. Congratulations, All Evan. Right. Liberty the God that failed is yours. Uh, Kristen, if I could just add a final note. Uh, I used to uh, joke when I was on Sirius XM and 
uh, you used to come on uh, all the time. You even met me up in <laughs> XM Studios, and we spent a couple of days together hanging out. I used to joke about, since I uh, came back to the faith and uh, began to discover a tradition, and then I read Liberty, the God, the Faith, because, you know, I'm a historian, an mm. amateur historian. Well, my history was largely incorrect, as many people's are. I used to uh, use on the Twitter, uh, and you can follow me at the King Dude if you want, hashtag life ruined. <laughs> because when you learn the things in Liberty, the God that failed, your version of American history is going to change. Folks, it's not just a seminal work. It's going to go in, in libraries uh, ev everywhere if it's not already there. It's a great book. It's a great read. And it's a great learning tool. If you're homeschooling, talk about a great history book. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Chris, I, joke, I joked with you one time that, dude, I could just read the footnotes for two years. Oh, right. <laughs> you lead me on so many rabbit holes with just the footnotes. So great job on the book, and, and thanks for the right. donation, Michael. You know, I just want to... I just want to add one thing here, uh, Chris. You're talking about the uh, the the size of the family and how that's really the the draw that we have to tell people about the joys of the family and everything else. I, I my wife every once in a while gets stopped by somebody who says, "Wow, you have so many kids. How do you do it?" And one of the things she says is, "Well, it's not like they're all infants. You know, <laughs> we've got seven kids and they're not all infants." But the other thing is that. Um, she she brings up an old Sicilian proverb, which is that every new baby comes with a loaf of bread under each arm. And uh, I, I love the imagery there because what it kind of says is that um, God will bless your gift of the child by, by sacrificing yourself. You know, the social kingship of Christ is represented in the sacred heart. And what's in the sacred heart is the wound. And the wound in the heart is is the self-sacrificial love that is called for the social kingship of Christ. I think that see what that you right said was fantastic. Me? Right behind me, you see an image of Christ the King Yep. and an image of Our Lady. So those are the two that will bring about this restoration if we appeal to them. Again, it's, it's not just a self-improvement program. It's, right. it's an appeal to the operation of divine grace. And without that, of course, any effort to restore society can, can only fail. You can't just talk people into being good on, on a natural level unless they are given the grace to do it. The church has always taught this. We can't just make ourselves better. In the end, we need the assistance of divine grace. All of us do. We're all sinners. Amen. And so so ultimately, it's a, it's a solution that comes from heaven in the form of grace. And that's what will bring about the restoration that we're discussing here today. I was going to say, hey, Ferrara, speak for yourself. I'm not a sinner. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. I, what is this sin you speak of, <laughs> sir? All right, Chris, as always... So many years, uh, what, eight years now, you and I have been conversing. I know you've known Michael for uh, forever. It's always great to see you, buddy. It's always great to see you. And we're so blessed to have your wisdom and your knowledge. K keep Absolutely. doing what you're doing, and thank you for being with us on Crusade Live. Thank you, Michael. God bless to you both. God bless God you bless too, you. brother. Wow, Michael. Look at this murderer's row. This is a murderer's row of intellect here. You start the day with the one and only Sir Charles, Sir Charles Coulomb, and then we get this wonderful little historical view mm. of how uh, Christ, uh, Christ the King has always, has been Christ the King throughout all of history, right? Mm -hmm. But and then and, and, and then Charles kind of brings the the historical narrative to us, and then we go to Dale Alquist, right? Mm -hmm. And then we get G.K. Chesterton, and we get this wonderful English author that just gives us so many nuggets and pearls of wisdom. But uh, uh, Dale also ties Chesterton's thought and distributism, which he actually said, misnomer, that yeah. bad name, terrible name, worst term ever coined, yeah. I think. No, no it makes so many people misunderstand it. But at the end of the day, Dale does a really good job and did a great job for us here on Crusade Live uh, explaining that it's not socialism. Right. It's, subs it's the two Catholic principles. Subsidiarity. Folks, the two principles from the social kingship of Christ that I want you to, to kind of focus in when it comes to when we talk about economics. And of course, you know, I think we have a speaker that's coming up about the social kingship of Christ and the home. Mm. You know, economy, the word economics or economy comes from the Greek economos, mm -hmm. and that means in the home. And so who is the greatest economist in the world? Your wife, Alyssa. Yeah. <laughs> my, right, wife, yeah. my wife, Maggie, my, my wife, Candace. 
Your wife is the greatest economist. Mm -hmm. They manage the home under the social kingship of Christ, right? Yeah. They manage the finances. They manage the food supply. Mm -hmm. So they do all these wonderful things, and people don't conceive of this, that this is an economy in your home. Well, think about it. Our Lady is the mediatrix of all graces, right? True. And so as the mediatrix of all graces, she is the head of the economy of grace. Right. So, you know, economy isn't just about the exchange of, of goods and money. It's also about the exchange of the good. You know, you want to talk about the economy of grace in line with the, the uh, social economy as well. So, guys,